Good afternoon. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary here in New York City. Thank you all for joining us for another in our series of Just Conversations, where we engage issues of racialized inequities intrinsic to our nation and our collective responsibility to create a more just future. We are kicking off our 2021 Just Conversations with Ms. Sheena Wright, who is the first woman to lead United Way of New York City in its nearly eight, and I should say in New York, in its nearly 80 year history. She began her work at United Way right after Hurricane Sandy in 2012. And so she hit the ground running by raising $11 million in disaster relief. That start was the first of many challenges that she has led United Way in meeting as she refocused their work that, uh, to prioritize United Way support of low-income New Yorkers towards self-sufficiency. I want to get into some of this work, but first, let me just thank Ms. Wright for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having this forum and certainly for the leadership and the work that you do. I, I am happy to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Well, thank you. Let's jump right in because there's much to cover in a little bit of time. When most people hear of United Way, you think of a charity organization, but I'm not sure that they really are aware of the significant work that United Way does and has done for decades worldwide uh, and in New York City to help bring the most vulnerable communities to a point of self-sufficiency. I recently looked at United Way's public policy agenda for 2021 and of course up front it speaks of the continued efforts to deal with the relentless challenges of COVID-19. So I want to start there. Mm. Already in New York, pre-COVID, over 900,000 New Yorkers didn't earn enough to meet their basic needs. Right. Yet only one third of those were considered poor. Yes. The invisible poor as you all have called them uh, identified at United Way. COVID has no doubt exacerbated that. Mm -hmm. So what has COVID laid bare that has perhaps refocused or reprioritized the work of United Way New York? And then what have you found most challenging to respond to? Well, it has been quite a journey. And as you said, when people think of, you know, United Way, it, it's they're not always exactly clear what we do, but they know that we are here to help. And so at any disaster, whether it was, you know, Hurricane Sandy or COVID, which is like 10,000 Hurricane Sandys that will end. Um, as we as we entered into this crisis, we were immediately, you know, called to be of service. And I think what we have been doing really for decades, really in the anti-poverty movement or in this work where we're really trying to achieve economic justice and economic mobility for low-income people in New York City and elsewhere, is that we've been tinkering around on the symptoms um, and never really explicitly calling out the root cause. And what COVID laid bare very quickly, because this is a life and death matter, right? It's not That's just right. about, not just about, but it's not solely about educational opportunities or workforce development and career paths. This is about whether or not you will have access to critical resources that will determine whether you will live or die. That's right. and, and in such stark terms, and people started to just to see so clearly, oh my gosh, your race matters the most. Your, your economic status matters the most in determining whether you live or die in the United States of America in 2020. Right. And then people started to say, well, why is that? I mean, why is that really? And then right after COVID kind of made us hunker down and we, we saw the the outbreak and how it was disproportionately impacting people, then George Floyd is murdered. That's and right. that makes the conversation even more pointed and even more clear because we witness, again, 
a death, right? The murder of this black man. Um, and it just, just really just, I think, rocked people in a different way where we can't just talk about the symptoms and in terms of like, we're fighting poverty and we want to have economic, it's like, we have to have a different kind of conversation. And so our job at United Way, right? Because we sit in a very unique spot. We've got hundreds of corporate partners. Uh, we've got hundreds and hundreds of community-based organizations that we work with. And we also partner with government. So we're able to be a nexus and a backbone to help the three sectors communicate, collaborate, align, and most importantly, act. Because we have to have a bold, coordinated response to address the issues and challenges that face us. And because and we also have a level of consciousness about why we're here that we have to leverage so we can move forward. There's so many layers, even in your response, as we think about how we got here, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the work that United Way tries to do to help us not continually to repeat this pattern. So right. I, I want to see if we can pick apart some of this, because I even want to get to, because people aren't fully aware that you also do or advocate policies. And so yeah. I want to I I get to that in a minute. But let's talk about this problem and what COVID laid bare uh, for some people and other people already knew. That's you right. know that we live in a nation, mm -hmm. we just must be frank, that has decided right uh to let black people die <laughs> right and get that we have gotten to the point in, or that we are at this point where covid impacts the black community three times uh uh greater than it does uh the wider community two times more likely to die but we know that we got here because they were the black community was already allowed to die Die. Right. So my question now is, because we know they have not had Black community and other communities of color have not had access to those things that would allow life to flourish, have not had access to health care. So here we are right, on the verge of getting access to a vaccine mm -hmm. for COVID, right? Regardless of the ways in which the Black community has long not trusted uh, the medical community, if we could get over that, how can we assure that the community is going to get access we, uh, to, to this vaccine? We've already seen that privilege is buying access. So how what is United Way doing to help uh, make sure that the most vulnerable communities actually have access to the vaccine? Absolutely. And our mission states that our job is to break down barriers and to build opportunities for low income New Yorkers, people of color in this city. And what we are doing very proactive and intentionally is making sure that our communities have the resources and the infrastructure to get a, a direct route to the science, to the data, to the to the um, the, the 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 medicine, the the all to testing, the vaccine, all of those things, and making sure that our faith community, the Black Church, has um, infrastructure in order to make sure that they can connect the community to these services. So we're doing it very programmatically on the ground, investing and in making sure, you know, I mean, I would say believe it or not, but I know you believe it. We actually did a data because we always were very data informed. We looked at all the data and we saw that there were testing deserts early on in this crisis. You couldn't even get a test if you yeah. live in certain neighborhoods and communities, right? That's so right. imagine how the infection rate was spreading uh, just like wildfire because people couldn't even get tested so that they could quarantine and, and keep their family and their community safe. So one of it is like, how do we make sure that there's equitable access to testing? How do we make sure that there's going to be equitable access to vaccines? Um, so very programmatically, we are trying to build that infrastructure to catalyze uh, to get that done. Um, the other thing we're doing, as you said, is on a policy. Uh, we've got to make sure federally, at the state level, at the city level, because one thing we've learned is that programs cannot fix 
what policy has forged. And if you're not working on, you know, the grass tops and the grass roots, you are going to win certain battles, but you will lose the war. And so our work is, 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 is program and policy, but with the goal to get to systemic change at scale. I'm so glad you said that. I like this program in policy because the programs can respond to the consequences. They can respond to the symptoms, but we are going to be right back in the same place if there is not systemic policy change. And, and I know that United Way works with the government and other agencies to try to create systemic change. Let me, let me talk about, as we talk about policies and systemic change, another area that COVID has laid bare, and I know that United Way does work with it, this has to do with children and education. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I know in New York, one of the poorest communities that you all work with, already only 10% of the children were reading at grade level. Right, right. And of course, we don't need data to tell us, but the data is coming out that's saying that these children are being left further and further and further behind, that the gap is widening. Right. So I had two questions. Mm -hmm. The first is, do you really believe that we will ever close this gap. In this instance, this educational gap uh, between the poorest children and other children. And so we're really talking about a gap between children of color. Mm -hmm. And if you believe we can close it, I'm not sure I do, but if you believe we can close it, how can we do that? Right. Well, not only do I believe it, uh, but it is an imperative that we do. Yeah. You know, really the future success and viability of our country depends on it. The lost kind of opportunity of, of, of activating the full promise and potential of our children, black and brown children, uh, low-income children, it, it, it's enormous. We have big challenges. You know, we got climate change, we've got all kinds of things. We need the people's minds and imaginations activated. We need them empowered. We've got to get there. So the first question is, do, we, do I think we can get there? And I wanna go back to something that you said earlier about you know, really understanding the root causes of how we got here and, and really kind of drill that down as it relates to educational opportunities. People talking about an achievement gap, but it's an opportunity gap. There's nothing wrong right. with, right? We, and you know that low income black and brown right. children, like there's not, it's not impossible for them, for us to achieve. It's That's about right. the opportunities that have been choked off. And so when we go back in our history and we know that it was a, a crime to teach black people how to read. Right. And we appreciate you know, what Brown versus Board of Education was fighting for. And that we also understand that as late as April, 2020, Detroit, successfully family sued their Supreme Court to say, you are not giving our black and brown children an equal access to education. So the answer, the how is make sure that you give our children the equal opportunities and access to resources to succeed and be successful. And we will show you that we'll get there. And just one, one example, we had an initiative and you talked about grade level reading. Whether or not you've learned to read by third grade is the biggest predictor of That's whether right. or not you've got a high school, but it's also what has been reported that prison planners can look at third grade test scores wow. to see how many prison beds they need. And we did go into a community when we started where 9% of the kids were reading at grade level. And so what we did is we said, let's step back and understand why. And it was about access to opportunity. They did not have the teachers needed support. They were some of the least experienced, least trained. That's right. they, they, they needed to have books at home. These were very low income communities that were struggling to buy food and pay rent. So they needed educational resources at home. They needed to be connected to healthcare access, you know, because this was a neighborhood that was an environmentally, environmental racism made it a dumping ground. These kids were just 
riddled with asthma, missing months of school. So we had to address those issues. And when you get to the root causes, we developed an initiative. We made sure that we were addressing these issues. We went from 9% of kids reading on grade level to almost 50% in about five years. And, and to that question, we asked one of the principals who was near 0% when we started, how many kids do you think can get there? When we started, she said about 20, that would be a success. She went from zero to almost 60%. Wow. And when you ask her today, she says, oh, at least 80% of the kids will get to read level, reading level proficiency. Now there's some kids that are just not, the test is not a good barometer for them. They're still brilliant and everything else, but that's how we have to think about it. It's about opportunity. And you ha we have to start with a mindset that our young people got all the promise of potential in the world. And it's our job to give them the opportunity to unleash it. And we need to uh, for our future. No, I, I, I agree so wholeheartedly with the opportunity gap. And sometimes I like to think of it as a choice gap that mm. has come down through generations that yeah. you know, one generation has limited choices. And even if they make the best choices available to them, they still, their limited choices means that the next generation has limited choices. So it's like the limited opportunities pass themselves down. I remember working in a school where the kids were brilliant. But in this school, they simply didn't have the resources. They achieved at the highest level they could with the resources that they had, but they were still left behind. Yeah. And so, so I so agree. There's one other thing you said that I don't want people to miss. When we talk about this prison, school to prison pipeline, mm -hmm. that prison, prisons are looking at or whatever the industrial uh, prison complex is looks at these third grade test scores mm -hmm. and take those as an estimate of how many beds they will later need. And none of them would ever admit that they do that. But you know, the Atlantic uh, had a, a very yeah. compelling article that really said, you know what, this is this this is. This is probably there's a real correlation here, uh, okay. and I and I and you know and I, many people certainly believe that to be the case because you got to project in terms of your real estate, but they would never explicitly say they do that. But it's it's too it's too connected. Um, no, that, yeah, that's right. And, and I think that school, like the school that you talked about, in, in terms of the resources, one of the other things to understand is that um, you know part of you know the systemic racism was drawing red lines around community right. and saying we are not going to lend to those communities we're not going to allow those communities to buy homes or start business we're going to starve them economically right? right and now right our how we invest in schools is based on a tax base that's right but if you have starved these communities economically because of race and now you're saying, well, then how much we'll invest, like you said, in the next generation and your future will be determined on how we've been discriminating against you, then you have this cycle. And so when you start to unpack it and then you say what's possible, you know, there are some things we need to change uh, systemically in order to That's get right. there. Just as you said, we've got to get to the root of the problem. The other thing, and I'll move on to another question because we're getting toward the end here, is, but the other thing that's interesting is you're talking about this in the cycle is that they look at test scores mm -hmm. and look at the schools that underperform and decide that those schools need to be closed. Right. I mean, <laughs> it's just an amazing cycle so that in somewhere like Chicago, most of the schools that were closed were indeed in communities that right. need these schools, not simply to educate their children, but what schools represent in terms of stability yes. uh, in a community. So it is an endless cycle that increases a gap, but you are so right in saying it's not people 
energy, done it to on time. And what comes from this? All of this has happened on, I like to say, for those of us in the faith community, on our watch. Hmm. What, and I know that United Way uh, New York and United Way in general, but United Way New York, a number of your partners are, are faith uh, communities and faith institutions. And I know the work that we ought to be doing as religious communities and faith communities. But what has been, what has been for you the greatest challenge in working with faith communities? I think, you know, and we work with 600 community-based organizations all over the city. And, you know, many of them are, are faith-based institutions because they're the ones with the food pantries and the soup kitchens and really kind of service and service in the community. And one of the things, and it particularly post-COVID, mm -hmm. is appreciating that these institutions um, haven't been resourced to have the institutional mm -hmm. capacity to actually do all that is that there is in their midst to do, right? Because there's been so much failure, you know, quite frankly, with government and, and, and other places, the nonprofits, the, the churches are, have to step in, right, and, and, and fill the gap. And what we know is right now, organizations are very fragile post-COVID, right? You know, everybody had to shut down, you know, how do you get in touch with members? How are you, how are you being resourced? Uh, it's a challenge. <laughs> and so that is a big challenge. And so a big part of our work is really to help to build capacity and be in partnership. I think another big thing that we're doing is ensuring that the churches are working together yeah. in an aligned and coordinated way. And, you say and, that nicely. Yeah. <laughs> Because, you know, they're all, we're in, they're all in the same business with the same community. And, um, and I think it's with any kind of organization or institution, you know, where sometimes we have so much on our plate, we, we work in a silo. But again, that's a, that's a, you can win that battle in front of you, but you're, you're losing the war. So how do we really support that coordination and alignment? And what we're finding is, you know, we just had a, a big convening across you know the churches and the cities and they're they were just so happy to be in the room with each other and to say oh I, what are you experiencing over there and can you know share and leverage and connect the dots but you have to create a space for that and there's not often a space for that for us to come together in community to collectively solve our problems and uh we got to get there and we have to make sure that the resources are there to support that wow there's so much more that we could talk about and the work that you do is tremendous and enormous and, and profound and not the least of which that United Way New York has served as that place that brings people together and, and builds coalition. And you're so right that coalition is so important if we are indeed going to win this war. Uh, where over uh, the kind of uh, policy systems and structures that leave communities uh, behind. So I wanna end with this question. If you were to close your eyes hmm. and see a just New York, and New York being a microcosm of what a just society might look like, what would a just New York look like? You know, I go back and think about um, my growing up. Uh, I was born and raised in the South Bronx. Uh, my mother was a teenage mom and I was in a community that did not look like a just society. Um, that was under-resourced where there, the schools were not you know, what they needed to be. And, and I imagine if I open my eyes as a young girl and can walk out of my apartment building in the South Bronx, uh, having had all that I needed and gone right down the street to a, a wonderful school that gave me all the kind of educational opportunity I needed and art and sports and everything else without fear, uh, violence, right? I grew up in, in, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, and you know, there was a there was a lot of challenge, um, and could it, it, and and just feel like I have 
everything that I need and I could dream big and a belief that I could achieve those dreams without other people projecting because you're black, because you're a woman, because you come from a low income community, telling me what I could not do, right? Because that that's that's um, that's an assault, right? And 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 really being able to be free of that, you know, the negative perceptions of who I'm supposed to be, and really being able to kind of step fully into all of the strength and beauty of of being a black woman from the South Bronx, and just and knowing that without having to defend it externally. Mm -hmm. Going on, you know, I went um, to a college and law school, not being underestimated uh, continually and persistently, um, not always being the first or the only, right? I was the second black woman to work at the law firm where I worked in the history of the firm, the first woman to lead the United Way, not, not feeling like that. Um, and just like it's normalized, right? And, right. And, 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 and there's opportunity that's equitable and unquestioned in terms of 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 how we experience um this place and space that we're in so that that's what comes to mind when uh when you ask well, that question that be able to dream big and others to support your big dreams and really think a society that thinks no matter how big you dream Mm -hmm. It's not too big. Right. Thank you for that. And thank you really for the work you do that allows children mm -hmm. to dream big and that we all might support that work. Thank you, Ms. Sheena Wright. Thank, thank you, you so much. for United Way New York. And thank you for this conversation. And thank you all for joining us.